Today I want to speak about the love of God, okay, and uh, how important and how um, vital it is, you know, that's why I chose the songs that we, um, that we sang, and um, yeah, let's, let's go for it. All right, so say this after me, this is God's Word, it is inspired by the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is on Bruce to preach. And the Holy Spirit is upon me to hear. So I will hear what the Spirit says. Amen. All right. So um, let's, let's, get, let's get started. I love how there's a guy called Mark Hankins. He had a saying that says, you know, God's got all the money in the world. As much as what you want. He's a good dad. He is a good dad. He's got whatever you need, but he'll give you $10 at a time. So that you keep coming back. He's not going to give you everything. He says he's going to give you as much as what he can so that you can come back to him. <laughs> he's that kind of dad. Look, I mean, I love that, that, um, uh, that, uh, that picture because though it might not be entirely accurate because he's given us everything according to the scriptures, what it says, but it, it describes God as he, he loves us. He wants us, you know. Um, we always sing about us, or we always have this idea about getting into his presence, but he is so, he is all about getting into our presence. I think we need to, we need to get a place where we understand that, that God wants to be in our presence. <laughs> Just think about that, you know. So, let me show you some, some scriptures. Obviously, um, this stuff that I preach is stuff that is, that is in my life and that is happening now. Um, so uh, I get to share uh, life, life in the, in the house of pastor and some of these things that we go through. But um, I know I don't go through things alone. And any preacher who says well, we don't go through things is a liar. Everyone goes through things. You know, as we we're always singing the song, uh, all my life, all I know. And then we sing mountain, high, valley, low. It's like it happens just like that. <laughs> One moment you're on top of the mountain and before you know it, you're down in the valley. Uh, you think that you're going to stay there for long. No, it can be like overnight, boom, you're in the, in the pit again. You know, it's like, how did I get you? And, uh, and, and so, though I believe in the grace of God, though I believe in, in favor that comes from God, I'm well aware that it's, that it's not easy. And God never said that it would be easy. He said, my yoke and my burden is easy, Right? Uh, what, he, what He brings and what He ministers to us. But He never promised that He said that life uh, is going to be easy. And so if you have had that experience in life, then I would like to invite you to come preach and teach us how to have an easy life. Life is, is, not, is not always easy, but it's lacquer. It's awesome to, to live and to experience. And, and um, well, how James says, if you just endure the trial, there is reward. You know, so, so whatever you're dealing with, I know that this is going to encourage you big time, big time. Uh, some of you guys know my own journey. Last year, I had a very weird year when it comes to my mind and, and um, started getting like these anxiety attacks and panic attacks. And it was always it's like the strangest things. Like I've never saw this coming, but uh, it happened once. And then all of a sudden, some of you guys don't know that when I get behind the pulpit, I start swimming, and I don't know where I am, and, and I've, I've learned to, to manage and to deal with those things, um, and uh, getting a lot of, like, revelation around, like, me, the person, you know, and, and why these things happen. We get to dig in. I love how uh, Romans 12 says we need to be renewed. We need to trans renew our minds and so produce transformation, but Ephesians 2 says, that you'll be renewed in the spirit of your mind, which speaks about a different kind of renewing. And so we, it's actually awesome, our, our um, adventure or our relationship with Jesus, um, how he, he teaches us how we should operate in, and how we can operate in him. So anyway, so um, I'm going to share a bit about my personal experience, and, um, and then we, I'm going to invite you into your own personal experience, obviously not into panic attacks, <laughs> but into, into the love of Jesus. And this, this word blessed me so much, so I can't wait to share it. All right, um, 
All right, so for the men who are there on, on Friday, you're going to get a little bit of a recap. But how many of you guys know what's the opposite of fear? Most often we would say faith, but it's not. The opposite of fear is love. The opposite of fear is love. If, if you want to be in a place where there is no fear, then you'll find yourself in a place that is full of love. Most of the times where you've been afraid is because you are not aware of the love of God. Most of the times where you're in, in places of ang- anxiousness or panic is because you are not aware of the love of Jesus. The first thing that, that uh, Adam and Eve experienced once they entered sin was fear. Um, they were afraid because they were absent from the presence of God. They experienced that fear. What does um, Timothy, Paul write to Timothy? God has not given you a spirit of fear, but of love. It doesn't say a spirit of faith. It says spirit of love. So it's like the opposite. God wants us um, to walk and to walk in love. Ah. You know, it's amazing. We come into a place like this, and we worship, and we sing songs like, He loves us. Are you worshiping? What are you doing? You know, what is worship? Oh, how He loves us. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. How He loves me. Um, Lorata, what's your name mean? Love. Good. Okay. And, and if you ever watched Lorata come into worship, um, is it, you can't, you can't, is she loving on God or is God loving on her? And that's really what worship is. It's, it's the ability to come into God's presence and to love Him and to be loved. We have to allow the, God to love us. I don't know how many of you know that. And um, so anyways, I don't want to get way ahead of myself. But um, let's quickly go to Mark uh, Mark chapter 6. All right, Mark 6, and then we read verse 30. All right, the apostles sent out as missionaries came back and gathered together to Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. He said to, to them, Come away by yourselves. To a deserted place and rest a while, for many were continually coming and going, and they had not e- even leisure enough to eat. And when they went in the boat to a solitary place by themselves, now many people saw them going, that's verse 33, and recognized them, and they ran there on foot from all the surrounding towns, and they got there ahead of those in the boat. As Jesus landed, He saw a great crowd waiting, and he was moved with compassion for them. Listen to that. What was he? He was moved with compassion. He was moved with compassion for them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. And when the day was already far gone, his disciples came to him and said, This is a desolate and isolated place, and the hour is now late. Send the crowds away to go into the country and villages round and buy themselves something to eat. He replied to them, give them something to eat yourselves. And they said, shall we go and buy 200 denarii, about $40 um, worth of bread and give it to them to eat? He said to them, how many loaves do you have? Go and see. And when they had looked, they said, we have five loaves and two fish. He commanded the people all to recline on the green grass by companies. So they threw themselves down in ranks of 150s. Um, like the, okay, I'm just skipping the brackets. Verse 41, taking the five loaves and two fish, he looked up to heaven, praising God, gave thanks, broke the loaves and kept on giving them to the disciples to set before the people. And he also divided the two fish among them all. And they all ate and were satisfied. And they took up 12 baskets full of broken pieces and of fish. And those who ate loaves were 5,000 men. And at once he insisted that the disciples get into the boat, go ahead of them to the other side, to Bethsaida, while he was sending the throng away. And after he had taken leave of them, he went off into the hills to pray. Now this is where I need you to follow. Now when evening had come, 
the boat was out in the middle of the lake, and he was by himself on the land. And having seen that they were troubled and tormented in their rowing, for the wind was against them about the fourth watch of the night between three and six, he came to them walking directly on the sea. He acted as if he meant to pass them by. It's a very interesting piece of text that whenever, you know, Jesus actually pretended to walk past them. Like he was not interested in the fact that they were like terrified. And he's going to now, um, yeah, have some comedy. I don't know, whatever it was. But when they saw him walking on the sea, they thought it was a ghost and raised a deep shriek of terror. For they, for they all saw him and were agitated. But immediately he talked with him and said, Take heart, I am. Stop being alarmed and afraid. All right? And he went up into the boat, and the wind ceased, and they were astonished. For, listen to this. They failed to consider <coughs> excuse me, and understand the teaching and the meaning of the miracle of the loaves. <laughs> <coughs> what did the loaves have to do with the, with the experience that they had on the water? Mountain high, valley low, I'm going to sing wherever I go. Just a couple of hours ago, Jesus multiplied five loaves. To 5,000 men. And they had like 12 baskets left over. So they had, they had a basket each, you know. They had a takeaway for each of the disciples from five loaves and two fishes. And yeah, they are, are, are in terror. And what Peter writes, I believe it was Peter, even though it's the book of Mark, what he, what he says there, he says, it's because they had forgotten, um, they had forgotten the miracle of the loaves. It's interesting. How quickly we forget. Huh? Like, how mindful are you of all the things that the Lord has done for you? And I, I think it's not because we forget that he provides. It's not because we, we forget that he can do all things. It's because we forget that he loves us. That's what it is. Because the Bible says in verse 34, when he saw them, he was moved with compassion. And that's why he multiplied the food. And when God sees us, he's still moved with compassion. You have to allow yourself to know that God loves you. Most of us sit here and we, we are unlovable. We can't, we can't even think that anyone would love us. Take, take the law, for example. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. How many of you guys love yourselves? Really, how many of you guys honestly love yourself? How many do you look at, look at yourself in the mirror and say, yes, my is a moi dung? <laughs> Seriously, how many of you actually love yourself? Today, be honest, right? <laughs> yeah. Be honest to yourself. And how do I take love that is corrupted and not understood and extend that to the person next to me? How can I give an accurate portrait of love to my neighbor if I can't even love myself. Okay? And so this is what Jesus' problem is. Hey, you are worthy of love. He loves you so much. And, and so you're in need again. But you, we miss the point. The point is that he, he provides, not because you need it, and because you're a schlep or you're a whatever. He provides because he loves you. And so when you think about every miracle that the God has done, you know why he did that? He loves you. He has compassion on you. And um, why we forget, how we forget that, how do we forget that? And so we need to remind ourselves, and I, I think it's a daily thing. It's a daily thing. So I'll, on, uh, on, on Tuesday night, Wednesday night, Tuesday night, Wednesday morning, about the third hour or the fourth hour in the morning, I'd, I'd picked up a, like an injury in, in my body and, um, hey, yeah, and uh, while I'm li lying on the bed, yes, I turn and I heard, I feel this crack in my, in my back, yeah, not this year, 
All right. So you know what not to do in cases like that is don't diagnose yourself on Google. Don't go on Google and diagnose yourself because you will get, uh, uh, yeah, what is the, um, the right word? Not when you're condemned, a dooming report, whatever you call it. <laughs> but anyway, so I read up and it didn't phase me. And I lied in the bed. It was about half past three, same time as the disciples <laughs> in the morning. And uh, next thing I know, I just got up, probably get to go to the toilet. And you know, if you get up too quick, sometimes you get a little bit dizzy. And Daislach, I don't know what's the... Um, yeah, dizzy. And so I'm waiting for that, it's like that black and white TV screen that you see <laughs> just to disappear. <laughs> but this thing's not going away. And I realized, my goodness, there is something wrong here. Something's, something is really wrong with me. And so I go to Anya Ayala, shame, or oh, Anya. I don't know how she does it. So it's so clean. So it's so, she's so small and and... Sometimes she has to carry me around and she has to do all kinds of things for me. But that night I said, Anya, I don't know what's going on. So she says that I'm saying, I'm going, I'm going. Now, I don't mean to say that I'm, I'm going. I, I felt like I was going though. And I'm losing consciousness of, of what's going on around me. And I realized something is really, really wrong. And um, we, I tell her, just take me outside and we go outside. And as we... As we go outside, I remember a little part about being outside, and then the next thing, I'm on the floor. I wake up and I'm on the floor. And in that place, in that zone of fear, in that zone of, am I going crazy? Am I losing my mind? Is it this stuff again that's happening to me? What is this? It's like, Lord, I don't mind broken ribs. I don't mind those things, but I really want to keep my consciousness. Now, in the week, the previous week, we were training with some guys, and I told them, listen, I just don't want to pass out. It's my worst fear. And I remember myself saying that. It's my worst fear. And lo and behold, a week later, I'm passing out, and I'm remembering the words that I spoke that I'm most greatly afraid of, and it's happened. And um, yeah, I can't tell you how emotional I got that morning, but I mean, because there was a lot going on. So I phoned all the doctors in the church. We've got a couple of doctors in the church. Shame. Check, go on WhatsApp. I see who's online. Lizarie was, I don't know, up at three, and I got hold of Antoine, I got hold of Inga and them, and they, they all came to the rescue. Listen, it helps. Yeah, Pastors' privileges. You guys can't do it. And, um, but anyways, we, we drove, Anya and I said, okay, let's just go for a drove, drive. My mom came to the rescue, but we drove around and I was deciding as to whether I would go to the hospital or not, but uh, we just left it. And I put on that song Highlands, you know, I will praise you on the mountains and I'll praise you when the mountains in my way. And we just started worshiping God. Went home and I remember just sitting at our um, at the table, and there's a Bible waiting. And one of my favorite things to do is to take a Bible and to say, Speak, Lord, and you look. And it landed on this verse. And when I read it, it was like, you know, why do you, why do you forget? And in that, that was my moment, okay? That was in my fear. But when I read this, I want you to think about your fear. I want you to think about what you're, what you're currently facing and what you're afraid of. This is what, what I read. Um, I'll give you the reference now, now. Just listen to it first. Cheer up, Zion. Don't be afraid. Yeah. For the Lord your God is living among you, and He's a mighty Savior. He will take delight in you with gladness. With His love, He will calm all your fears. He will rejoice over you with songs. I'll read that again, one more time. This is what God says. Cheer up, Zion. Don't be afraid. For the Lord your God is living among you. He's a mighty Savior. He will take delight in you with gladness. With all His love, 
He will calm your fears. He will rejoice with you, over you with songs. That's Zephaniah 3 verse 17. If you guys want to go read it at home and, you know, put it somewhere in your house where you can see. And it's interesting, at, men, we, at men's meeting Friday we spoke, it's that the word don't be afraid or the phrase don't be afraid or do not fear is in the Bible apparently over th- about 365 times. That means that's like once a day. <laughs> That if you, you, would, you can apply a verse that says, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Now listen, there's not a person in this place that doesn't struggle with a sense of fear. A news report or, a, or whatever it is. And, and God says, hey, I want to come and I want to exalt over you with singing. There's this other song. I'm doing a lot of songs today. Wow. I'm doing a lot of singing. He says, Lord, I'm amazed by you. And the one of the, the, the verses in the song says, you dance over me while I am unaware. And it's, it's like when I hear that lyric, it's like a heartbreaking lyric. Because, because it's that verse that says he rejoices over us with song. How many of us have heard him rejoice over us with song? How many of us have taken time in our religion, in our traditions, to sit and allow God to minister to us? to sing over us, to love on us. Does that offend you? In Mark chapter 13, um, I was going to read it. Um, Jesus takes a cloth and he he says to his disciples, come, I'm going to wash your feet now. Peter refuses and, and he says, you will not wash my feet. And Jesus says, if I don't wash your feet, you can have nothing of me. And I realized then how important it is God wants, Jesus wants to minister to you. He loves you. And I could never understand, like, why when I come into his presence, do I feel better? <laughs> because he's actually just loving on you. And when we worship, and that's why I, 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 I pick on Lerato, but I mean, because I think it's exemplary. You can literally see when she worships, she soars. And she doesn't care about who's watching her. And he's, because right in that place, the Lord will come and just, it's like, I'm worshiping you, but I'm healing at the same time. I'm feeling better at the same time. So, um, yeah, he loves you. But Mark 12, let's read there. Hope that this is blessing you, because it blessed me, set me free. Big time. We have to know one thing about the law. For those, like Paul writes to the Gentiles, he says, you are bent over by doing the law. You are determined with doing the law. You can't. You can't. You cannot. And that was the purpose of the law, is to show you that you need a Savior, that you can't do it. It pointed you to Christ. You can't fulfill those things. Yeah, you know? Um. So, Mark 12, verse 29, Jesus answered, The first and principal one of all commands is, Listen, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and you shall love the Lord your God out of and with your whole heart, and out of and with your, all your soul, and all your mind, which is your understanding, and out of all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as you love yourself. There is no other commandment greater than this. So we already spoke about this. How can I love my neighbor if I don't love myself? What does love look like? And that's one of the things where what the law does, it it puts this demand on us that we, we can't attain to, that we can't reach to, that you know, we just can't do it. Um, this came to me. Orchid shared a message on on uh, on Friday at the men's. Thank you, Orchid. That was a powerful word. In in John thirteen, let's go there. Yeah, oh, this hit home. This really hit home. John thirteen verse thirty four. Jesus says, "Yeah." 
I give you a new commandment, that you should love one another just as I have loved you, so that you, sh- so you too should love one another. So you know what he does? If, if someone who is not intimate in a relationship with Christ hears that, he can never make it. He can never make it. How can we follow a commandment where we love one another as Christ loved us? Jesus said, there is no greater love than that for a man to lay his life down for his friends. <laughs> Listen nicely. Because he loves you first, he shows you what that is. He demonstrates that to you. He, he takes the first step and he loves you. And so you, you will never be able to love someone in that commandment, if you have not allowed Jesus to love you. If you have not come to a place where you open your heart to the love of God and say, okay, Lord, here I am with all of my stories. You can love me. (laughs) And when we open our hearts to the love of God, I'm telling you, it happens that you love your neighbor. It happens that you love um, your, your family. It happens that you love yourself because you're allowing him to love on you so i want to encourage you today if you've never come to the place where you can open your heart and say lord love me (laughs) here i am you can love me put on worship music and just sit in his presence or whatever that looks like man um whether that means go walk in the felt or on the farm or whether it means you, you know quiet place in the room and you just sit there and sit in his presence and hear him say, I love you. Because religion teaches us to be devoted to God, to obey commands, to to try and attain to a level where we are accepted by him. Under Jesus, he took all the steps and he performed first and says, I did this all for you and I love you. I love you. I love you. Amen. So that's, that's the standard. Um, that's the standard. So I'm going to repeat myself from a sermon I did, but Revelation chapter 2, what you're facing, the fear that you have, that you're experiencing, is because you haven't abided in God's love. That's all. The fear that you have is a result of not abiding in God's love. The stress that you have is a result of not abiding in God's love. Okay, it's, it's actually simple. I'm not saying that it's easy, but I do know that he does most of the work. He says here, verse 4, I have this one charge against you, that you have abandoned the, uh, your first love. Let's, let's do it in, the, in the, the King James. This one doesn't say it nicely. It doesn't fit in the sermon. Verse 4 in the King James. All right, it says, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Go to 1 John chapter 4 and verse 19. 1 John 4 verse 19, it says, We love him because he first loved us. Our response, the the love that God wants, if he wants me to walk in my first love for him, I have to understand that the first love wasn't me discovering God. It was me opening to the love of God. My first love is a response to his love. My first love is a response to me opening up to him. It's not me trying to love from a place where I don't understand what love is. And this is what Jesus does. He models it. He showed it. He portrayed it. That's why he says, husbands, love your wives as I've loved the church. He's not trying to show you something that hasn't been done before. He's trying to show, like, if you'll take the love of Christ, put it, be loved, extend it to your wife. (laughs) If you take the love of Christ, allow yourself to be loved, extend that to your neighbor. First, be loved. That's why it doesn't work, because you're trying it from a place where you're empty yourself. I'm just, and I'm sitting there, and it's like, oh, Lord, sorry. And I'm just like, here I am. 
Yeah, and you love me. And just those words. Maybe let's, let's I'm going to hit the finishing line now. Um, so what I said earlier, Jesus had to go. Jesus multiplied the food to demonstrate his love. So now, while the, the disciples are in the boat, they could have been dwelling on the fact that God loves, that Jesus loves. But instead, they isolated themselves in fear. And how many of you guys know that what you don't learn by revelation, you will learn by situation? <laughs> What you don't learn by revelation, you will learn by situation. So yeah, they go on a trip to Bethsaida, and they learn by situation again that he loves us. And they could have just dwelt in the revelation, we're going to be okay, he loves us. And this is what Paul speaks about in Romans 8, he says, What can ever separate us from the love of of Christ? And he names all the situations, sickness, death, calamity. No matter what comes, nothing can separate us. Um, Did I say we're going somewhere? Did I give her a reference? Okay, I didn't. Let's let's wrap it up. Let's read this in... um, Okay, yeah. Let's quickly read John 13. I said I wasn't going to do it, but I want you to see um, the Father, what Jesus does for us. Verse 4, Jesus got up from supper, took off his garments, and taking a servant's towel, he fastened it around his waist. Then he poured water into the wash basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the servant's towel with which he was girded. He came to Simon Peter. Peter replied to him, Lord, are my feet to be washed by you? Is it for you to wash my feet? Jesus said to him, you do not understand now what I'm doing, but you will understand later on. Peter said to him, you will never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, unless I wash you, you will have no part with uh, in me. Okay, now Ephesians 5 verse 26 speaks about Jesus who comes and he washes us today. He washes us with his words. I'll read that quickly, then I'm going to close. Verse 25, husbands, love your wives. That's Ephesians 5 verse 25, excuse me. Husbands, love your wives. Wives, nudge your husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by washing of the water with the word. And so that's why it's so important. How does God love you today? How does God love you? Well, obviously through his presence, through through word, through hearing something like this. How many of you guys already feel God has spoken to me? God has cleansed me. God has made me new. And that's how he loves on you. So you need to allow yourself to love him. And that he might present the church to himself in glorious splendor uh, without spot or blemish. Okay, let's close in James chapter 4. Woo. This word, is, like I must tell you, although I love this word, it's tough to preach because I will not ill. And I don't have a nice way of crying. <laughs> That's the worst. I don't cry like uh, and then there's nice tears coming down. Like, <laughs> <laughs> so I never want to get into that place. So I'm fighting it. <laughs> right, James is James chapter four. Um Robbie, can you do it in the Passion Translation for me, please? Just Ephesians, if, uh, James 4, and um, we're going to read from verse 5. Beautiful, beautiful translation. 
And um, we're going to read it nice and strong, like, like Bill Johnson says, he likes his coffee really strong. And so it says a lot of nice stuff, but I want you to also see the intensity of, of what he means. He means business, all right? So there is repentance when it comes to the love of God, to receiving. There is an opening of our hearts when it comes to it. But listen, does the scripture mean nothing to you that says, the spirit that God breathed into our hearts is a jealous lover who intensely desires to have more and more of us? Can you handle that verse? Can you really, like, if you, if you hear that, can, can you handle the fact that, that the spirit of God is a jealous lover? who loves you so intensely. I don't know how many of you guys have experienced something like that. You know, I remember when Anya and I started dating, you know, like, I just want her attention. Don't give anyone else attention because then there's problems. Then there's issues. Then there's going to be a talk. But the Spirit of God that God breathed into our hearts is a jealous lover who intensely desires to have more and more of us. Let's read on. But he continues to pour out more and more grace upon us. For it says, God resists you when you are proud, but continually pours out grace when you are humble. So then surrender to God. Stand up to the devil and resist him, and he will turn and run away from you. Okay, devil is impatient. You can outlast him. Move your heart closer and closer to God. And he will come even closer to you. Make sure you cleanse your life, you sinners. <laughs> Listen to it. Let me, let me just tell you. Small sin and big sin is sin. But the blood of Jesus is the blood of Jesus. Make sure you cleanse your life, you sinners. Keep your heart pure and stop doubting. I think feel the pain of your sin. I think that's good. Be sorrowful and weep. Let your joking around be turned into mourning and your joy into deep humiliation. Be willing to be made low before the Lord. You know what he'll do? He'll exalt you. You come to a place and say, yes, Lord, forgive me for my stubborn heart. Forgive me for my religion, my my." know-it-all mind that justifies everything that I do, justifies my behavior, gets to a point where we understand he's a jealous lover who wants all of us. And we come to a point where we just open our hearts to him. Open our, come and love on me, Lord. Maybe today, that's what you need today, the Lord to love on you. I can guarantee you that's what you need. <laughs> that's what you need. You need the Lord to love on you. Lord, I love you. I'll die for you. Peter, you're going to deny me three times. You don't impress me with what you're doing. You'll deny me three times. He comes to a point, he says, okay. Peter says, okay, Lord, bath me. <laughs> Wash me. And that's what we, that's what we want. So, so if you're battling with yourself, you feel like you're a nobody, whatever, or if you feel like you're a somebody, it's the same thing. If you're battling with fear, anxiety, depression, pride, grief, a low self-esteem, come on, man, pride, when you think too much of yourself, it's also when you think too little of yourself. I want you to see yourself just taking one step towards the love of God today. Just take one step to Him. One step to the love of God. And He'll take 99 <laughs> to you. You take one move in response to His love. He will overwhelm. He will, he will <laughs> he'll bring His presence in such a way that it calms all fears. That same spirit that is jealous over you, that same spirit is the same spirit 
where, where Jesus said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me to heal the sick, to bind up broken hearts, to, to restore and to, to bring deliverance to the captives. That same Spirit is there today to heal you, to liberate you, to free you. So Father, I thank you, Lord, with everyone here. I want to invite you, Father, to just come and to love on these people today. Just to come and to love on us today. We step aside, we put our programs aside, we put aside what must happen. And I, I ask your Holy Spirit that you